in the house. Amen. Bless you, Lord. You may be seated. Guys, if you would start the, uh, the tape that I want to show. Go ahead. <coughs> I love you, Lord. God. 
Missionaries and evangelists across the span of time have been traveling throughout Africa, administering hope to as many souls as possible. The constant threat of disease and war has left the continent in a very fragile state. Since the 19th century, missionaries like David Livingston have been visiting tribes and villages, spreading the word of God to those who have never heard it. Dr. Livingston spent over half his life traversing Africa, talking to every person that was willing to listen, discovering several untouched tribes and landmarks. With no consistent means of travel, disease and natural danger were a constant threat for Dr. Livingston. Even though his death to malaria in 1873 closed the door on his ministry, it opened the door to several others to the continent. Today, missionaries and evangelists face a new accumulation of problems. AIDS is spreading across Africa every day due to poor medical aid, attention, and little understanding of the disease. With over 23 and a half million people living with HIV and AIDS in Africa, there are around 3.5 thousand related deaths a day. This is causing 15 million children to be left in orphanages for something they have no control over. Children are the most affected as they are born with the disease or given the disease unwillingly, causing millions of deaths every year. Water shortages, constant threat of war, and low food supply are continually affecting ministers and ministries. Africa is currently in a state of desperation. But there is hope. There is a new group of people willing to sacrifice their lives for the gospel in Africa, just like Dr. Livingston. KAG East University is raising generation changers that are spiritually alive, strategically focused, academically excellent, and ready for today's cultural challenges. Since 1979, over 2,000 students have graduated and have been sent across Africa and the world. In order to accommodate student growth, new dorms will be needed. With your help, we are seeking to raise $150,000 to fully furnish two dorm buildings so 12 more apartments can be provided. Starting with just 200 students in 1979, KAG East University now is serving 700 students and is quickly running out of room. With your help, we will be able to partner with KAG University, not only in our prayers, but also in our giving. If we help build these dorms, we can help change the continent of Africa. Will you help us? We are at the uh, end of the service. This is Kenya Assembly of God a School. Uh, trains ministers, raises them up. And um, matter of fact, the president of the college will be at our district council this year. Uh, at the end of the service, the staff and I will be heading to uh, Douglasville to, uh, to our district council. And um, we would like to take an offering to bless this work in Kenya. So at the end of the service, there will be ushers posted at the door. And I would encourage you to just give what God lays on your heart. They're doing an awesome work. And, uh, and we would like to be a part of that. We would like to sow into that. So if you'll do that, that will be a great blessing to us and, and to them. And also just... Uh, we didn't tell Pastor Glenn or with, with so much going on, but my home group will not be meeting tonight. There's some issues going on with the plumbing and the fellowship hall. Uh, so stay at home and eat your baked potato. And uh, take a night off. So, uh, And anyway, uh, Tony Lamb is going to fill in for me, and she'll, she'll have what she's going to do next time we meet. But um, So I wanted to get that announcement out there. I want to mention it's good to have you today. If you would... Um, turn over in the Word to Luke chapter 19, and um, if you have a bulletin on the back is a sermon outline, and uh, I want to share an important message with you today. <coughs> Luke chapter 19, wave at me if you're there. If I get enough of you there, I'm going to go. Verse 1. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through, and a man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but being a short man, he could not because of the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. And when Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once, and he welcomed him gladly. And all the people saw this, and they began to mutter, He has gone to be 
the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I'll pay them back four times the amount. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. I want to do a message today entitled How to Go from Short Changed to Eternally Changed. How to Go from Short Changed to Eternally Changed. Uh, when I was doing this message and doing my notes, I typed up and instead of eternally changed, I wrote, I typed in externally changed. And I thought about that. Who wants to go to externally changed? I just had my car detailed the other day and um, had it all polished and shined and had my wheels done and everything and when I got home my daughter-in-law saw it and she said did you get new tires the car actually looked new but see the tires have several thousand miles on them the car has over 200,000 miles on it we can do things externally to look good but it's what's on the inside that really is going to count. You know, we live in a generation that is so focused on external things that we change the way our houses look. You know, you can, you can power wash your house and it can shine on the outside and still the termites be killing it on the inside. I mean, still be dirty. Come on, nobody in here has a dirty house, I understand. But somewhere out there, people have dirty houses. They have, it's been years since they've seen their floor. They couldn't tell you the color of their carpet. And people get their, their, their bodies worked on. And, and the thing that happens when you start doing that kind of stuff, uh, church, and that's kind of the way Christianity and religion is gone. We sort of dress up the outside. And you do that, and after a while, it just it doesn't even look real anymore. You know, and after a while, it, uh, it starts looking corrupted. And after a while, you can't even recognize. It, it begins to disfigure us. And I'm afraid spiritually these days there are a lot of churches that are disfigured. There are a lot of believers that are disfigured because they've just been dressing up to look good for so long. Or we've been putting on fronts for so long because we're really hurting on the inside that it's affected us. Can somebody relate to what I'm saying? It's affected us. So what I want to deal with today is, um, is, is how to go from short change. You know, uh, Zacchaeus was a guy probably that felt short changed. You know, short people get overlooked sometimes. Short people that because of their stature, um, you know, uh, coming up in school, there, you, there was, you know, fat jokes, your mama jokes, short people jokes. And I'm sure Zacchaeus heard his share of short people jokes. How many of you have ever, don't raise your hand, joked about a short person? We do it sometimes without even thinking. Okay, so I'm the only one. But listen, it's still not right. Zacchaeus was a short person. I'm sure that uh, somehow it affected his disposition. It affected his, his personality, his self-esteem. Um, and because he was short-changed, you know what he did to get back? He short-changed others. Sometimes those of us that feel short-changed, the way to get back is we short-change somebody else. So we, we try to get back at them and do things that maybe we shouldn't do. So... So he was not only short in stature, he was short-sighted. Um, he was a tax collector, but he was rich. You know, Jesus one time said that it, it would be easier for a camel to get through an eye of a needle than a rich man to get into heaven. Aren't you so excited today that none of us are rich? But can I tell you something? I know you got your name on a lottery ticket out there. I understand, but... And you're hoping, and just because you're going to be the one when you when that, when your ship comes in, you're going to bless this church and Pastor Joey and the ministries, and that's what you're telling God, Lord. I this may not be right; it may be sin, but bless God, whoo! You just let me win that win that lottery, and I'm going to be blessing somebody. Yeah. I'll get that gym named after me, maybe to a ball field or or just something, something somehow, somehow I'm going to get blessed. But Jesus made this statement, and I'm talking on the same page. As we read this story of Zacchaeus, Jesus makes this statement about a rich person going through the eye of a needle. Well, let me tell you a little something about that because you and I think, well, how can that be fair? Because we watch some rich preachers on TV, come on. We read some books written by rich preachers. And so we know that God blesses his people, but this is the thing. 
You know, there literally was, there was 12 gates in the city of Jerusalem. One was literally called, referred to as the eye of the needle. And in order for a camel with his big packs to get through this gate, and that's what Jesus was referring to, to get into the city, that camel had to get down on his knees and almost crawl. He could get through, but he could only get to the gates of the city, could only get into heaven if he got on his knees. Can I tell you this? A rich person, no matter what, if he'll get on his knees and get into heaven. Some of you that may think it's going to take a miracle to get you into heaven, going through the eye of a needle, if you'll just get on your knees. Well, this is the deal. This was the story that Jesus was telling, and, he, and this was the analogy that he was given. And then he comes up on this scene and comes into the city, and um, what we know from Scripture, we get a description. And how would you like to be described as the short person? The, oh, that's the person that talks too much. Well, that's the person that's uh, yeah, a little healthy. That's the tall person. Uh, that, you know, sometimes we refer to people in negative ways. And so we look at Scripture here, and we find out, and back in, in Scriptural times, if you were a tax collector, and we're not thrilled about taxes and tax people ourselves in this generation, but it was really bad back then because tax collectors were crooks and they were cheats. So we read what the Bible says. The Bible says he was short. Now just put yourself in Zacchaeus' shoes here, okay? He was short. He collected taxes. He was rich. He was a sinner. He had never seen Jesus, but he could climb like a monkey. Now he had a whole lot going for him, but he could get up a tree. This little guy could climb up and get to the top of a sycamore tree. Now can you visualize Donald Trump climbing a tree? Red hair flapping in the wind. I mean, really, just get a visual of that. I mean, get a visual of that. Well, that's what people were seeing because Zacchaeus was well known. And, and normally rich people in, in these times were more, they, they, they were tended to be overweight. And so he's got rich robes and he's got the, the, the best store-bought Nike sandals you could buy back in the day. And he, he, he's, he's encumbered. And this guy in order to get a better look, a glimpse of Jesus, is willing to climb a tree. What are you willing to do to see Jesus? What are you willing to do to get in his presence? I mean, what are you willing to do? I mean, we, we complain sometimes that we have to get out of bed and come to church. This guy made a point to get in position to see Jesus. He made a point to get in the right spot so he could see Jesus. Now, the Bible says Jesus was just passing by. Jesus don't just do anything. Understand, Jesus doesn't just do anything. Jesus always has a reason. He always has a, a purpose. There's nothing casual about him. Jesus, I believe, is always intense. And so he comes to this place. He hits the spot. He looks up, and he says, Zacchaeus, get down here now. And you know what? He says, you come immediately. Now listen, I used to climb trees, and you don't get down from a tree quickly unless you jump. You know what I believe happened? I believe Zacchaeus jumped. You know, I wish we were the type of people that when God speaks, we jump. There have been people in our, maybe it was dad, maybe he was a disciplinarian, but maybe it was that old first sergeant when we were in the army, but when they said move, we moved. And Zacchaeus' heart was in such a place that he jumped. I really believe that he jumped out. I believe he jumped out of the tree because if you read that, Jesus says, come down now, come down this instant. The Bible says, instantly he came down. And then the next thing in the Bible says, then he stood up. Well, he couldn't have stood up if he hadn't have fallen. So I believe he fell. I believe he hit the ground for Jesus. So there was a divine appointment. He came down. He didn't stall. He didn't beat around the bush. And the Bible says he welcomed Jesus gladly. The Bible says he repented. The Bible says that he made restitution. The Bible says he gave half his wealth and he was willing to up to four times. Anybody that he had done wrong, he wanted to bless. And Jesus said, because of your heart, because of your spirit, even though you're a tax collector, even though you've done people wrong because of your changed heart and attitude, church, you can change your heart and attitude today. Some of us have done wrong things. Some of us may be in here bearing some guilt of some things that we have said and done. Some of us are suffering because of what somebody has said and done to us. But I want you to understand, today's the day of salvation. Today he wants to come to this house. Today he wants to come to your house. 
and touch your heart and change your life. Now, as I read this, and I'm kind of setting up the, one of, what, the points that I want to make for us today, but the, th- the point that I want to make here is Jesus never lost sight of his mission. Now, we have to understand and get an idea of what Christ was, was going through. He had, to, he had to spend all day, if you read the preceding chapters and passages, he had spent all day um, doing conflict resolution. When I have board meetings and sometimes staff meetings, one of my headings a lot of times will be conflict resolution. I don't have to put nobody's name. I don't have to put what the issue is. But I put conflict resolution all day long. Jesus had been dealing with conflict resolution. He had been dealing with people. How many of you know that ministry would be a breeze if it wasn't for people? And so Jesus had been dealing with things. There had been issues. There had been problems even with his own disciples. But I'm sure he was stressed out. But Jesus has ministry patterns just like us. I love to read in the New Testament about Jesus. I I love to read how he connects things and he puts things together because he never loses sight of his mission. And what you and I have to understand, at this point in his ministry, the cross was right before him. The cross was almost in view. He was on his way to Jerusalem. And he was letting the disciples know that these things have to happen so that you understand what's going on. And so on the, the, and everything Jesus does is he's teaching somebody something. He's trying to sow into somebody's life. Just think if, if, if the world, if moms and dads, if, if believers wouldn't waste so much time on things that don't matter and on foolishness and if we spent our time, even if we've got to go to the dentist and have that tooth pulled and we've just been dreading it for weeks on end or we've got to go have surgery or we're struggling to make the house payment or we know we're going to get laid off and and we get so obsessed with the mess that we're in that we forget there's people that need what we have to offer. There's still... Some way God can let us bless somebody. Jesus was encumbered, I'm sure emotionally, by the cross. It weighed heavy on him. He was, he was God, but he was man. And he had this set before him. And in the process, it's not, it, it wasn't all about Jesus. And, and as he's journeying and he's headed towards Jerusalem, he's headed towards the cross, Jesus must have had a heart for tax collectors because we read in a couple of passages over that there's a tax collector that's come to the church and he's pouring his heart out. And there's a Pharisee standing there and the Pharisee is saying, what are you doing here? You don't belong here. See, unfortunately, there are churches like that that feel like certain people don't belong in the presence and in the blessings of God. They don't deserve God's best. And this Pharisee was saying, you know, I, I pay my tithe and I'm a man of the cloth, but you're a tax collector. And he's saying this so people can hear. He's berating this tax collector. Jesus loved tax collectors. I think they were like a challenge to Jesus. If you could get a tax collector, man, you could get anybody. He even made a tax collector one of his disciples. Matthew, come on, man, I love you. I'll show you how to do things right. Zacchaeus, I'm going to go home and eat with you today. Tells the Pharisee, you need to love this man because, uh, because his soul is worthy of salvation too. So Jesus is going through this. He's, dealing, he's, trying to, he's trying to set an example for the church, letting you and I know, I'm about to go to the cross. I'm going to be gone. You're going to be here. You're going to be here to preach my message and live my example. And you've got to love tax collectors. You've got to let prostitutes sin. You can't banish people with tattoos. Everybody with a tattoo, stand up. I'm kidding. Like, Sister Smith stands up. You know. <laughs> I mean, but we feel like that if we don't look a certain way or act a certain way. But Jesus is, is saying, I'm going to be gone soon. You've got to be the church. And if a tax collector's heart has been pricked by the Holy Spirit and he, he sees the air of his ways, you've got to let him in, you've got to love him. And then he runs across this rich dude that's got all this money. And he comes to Jesus and he says, what must I do? What do I have to do to be a Christian? 
What do I have to do to find favor? What do I have to do to make it to heaven? Lord, just tell me, and I'll do whatever you ask me to do. And Jesus said, well, I want everything you got. Sell everything and follow me. Well, Lord, I mean, I, I'm the, I want to come, but can we, like, negotiate? Can I just keep my pickup truck? See, Jesus looks at the heart. Jesus is dealing with this. He's dealing with somebody that says they want to be a disciple, but they're not willing to give up what it requires to be a disciple. Uh, because we're all different, church, it means there's not a cookie-cutter way to make this thing work as a disciple. The things I may have to give up may be different than what you, you have to give up. How I have to dress may be different than how you have to dress. My call for ministry may be, may be different from what you're called to do. But the Holy Spirit is there to show us and to help us. And so Jesus is dealing with this guy, and he's... Uh, Wanting to tell this guy, you know, who the rich dude felt shortchanged, man. He's like, Lord, I've, I've raised all this money and I've worked and I've earned this money and, uh, and now I feel shortchanged that you're telling me I've got to give everything away. And the Pharisee probably felt shortchanged and now he's in the service and uh, he's, he's at church and he's being compared and there's a guy that's a, a tax collector that gets to come in and worship right alongside of him. And that was probably something hard for him to deal with. But Jesus said, those that are willing to give everything, and he's talking to the rich guy, and he says, you know, those that are willing to give everything will receive not only a lot here. Now, just think about this. If you're willing to give, because I know a lot of the message we hear is, you know, if, if you give this, God's going to do that or whatever, but God's word is true. And Jesus said, listen, I want to bless you two ways. He said, if you'll just be willing, if your heart will be right, and you'll be willing to give everything for the cause of the gospel to me, I will bless you here. Now, it may not be the way we want to be blessed, but God will give you what you need, not what you want sometime, but what you need. And then he says, not only are you going to get a big blessing here, you can get a better blessing there. So Jesus says there's like, there's like a double blessing here if, if you'll just be willing to give. So we're dealing with people. Jesus was dealing with people that really needed eternal change but felt shortchanged. The blind beggar, the next guy, he goes up, and, and there was the children. There were children that were wanting to come to Jesus, and the crowds wouldn't let. They told, they told the children they were bothering Jesus. And then outside of Jericho, he, he, he passes a blind beggar that I'm sure he felt shortchanged. He'd spent his whole life. Um, you know, Zacchaeus had never seen Jesus. The blind beggar could never see Jesus. And I'm sure he felt shortchanged. And he was a burden to people. They were even annoyed when he cried out, Jesus, Jesus. They were annoyed that he was causing trouble and he was a distraction. But they both had an encounter. Both of them had to be told that Jesus was passing by. Zacchaeus had to be told that Jesus was coming to town. He just didn't know. The blind beggar had to have somebody say, Hey, Jesus of Nazareth is coming. The world has got to have somebody to tell them that Jesus is passing by. I've got to say to you today, Jesus is passing by in this place. Some of you have felt that presence. Uh, some of you, for different reasons, haven't felt it. You know, sometimes even those of us that are spirit-filled and have been in church a long time, sometimes we're a little dull to the movement of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes we need somebody to say, hey, God's in this place. Will you get in position to be touched? God's in this place. Can you get your heart right? God's coming. Will, will you get your spirit in a place that you can see him or hear him or at least feel his touch? Will you do what needs to be done? And our job is to tell people that he's, that he's coming, that he's passing by, and we are commissioned and responsible. We're a part of God eternally changing people's lives. Now, in chapter 31, 34, we get a glimpse of why these things are unfolding. One... There are real lives that need to be changed. We see it in the little children. Jesus is sowing into them. We see in two tax collectors, Jesus is sowing into them. We see a Pharisee. Jesus is trying to change his heart. We see a blind beggar. So we see Jesus is all about doing ministry. But the Bible says, and this is what Jesus says, we're going to Jerusalem so everything written by the prophets about the Son of Man may be fulfilled. Everything's got to be fulfilled. And the Bible says that the disciples still did not understand in Bible speak, it says they did not have a clue. 
They still didn't get Jesus. And he's doing all these things. He's leading by example. He's going to the place where he's going to die on the cross, and they still didn't get it. They still didn't understand. Church, this scares me to death. I feel like we have a, a church culture that doesn't get it or understand Jesus. We think it's okay to take what man says the word says and to change little things here and to do things different there and to wipe certain, uh, take, take certain sins off the board and, and put in feel-good stuff, which feel-good stuff is cool. But the problem is this. We, the, the church is, is getting to a place where we're totally clueless. The average Christian today doesn't understand the plan of salvation, doesn't understand that this is infallible. The Word of God's infallible. The New Age type Christian today wants her to debate this. That a little bit is true and this is good and that's not good. And somebody said this when they should have, should have said that. And, and, and this sin uh, uh, was sin then, but today it's okay. And Jesus is saying, listen, it's disciples. You, you all have to get a grip. Church, we got to get a grip. I believe there's the same kind of spirit. The spirit that was there when Jesus walked the earth is the, it's the same spirit here. That's why he's coming back. There's an ignorance out there. There's a, there's, there's a, there's a, a falseness out there that's got to be dealt with. So Jesus is trying to help them understand that what they're seeing is they're seeing the Bible come to life. They're seeing the word of God that the prophets wrote down come to life in him. And if they would have just cried out, the beggar cried out. Um, when we come to this altar, we cry out. What does he do? He stops and he touches and he ministers and he, he meets our need. The tax collector was in the temple crying out. The little children were crying out, wanting to get to Jesus. Zacchaeus was in the tree. He, was, he would have cried out. And when Jesus called him, he, he said, Lord, I want what you have. I want to change. Sometimes we're just too proud or too stubborn to cry out. There comes a time in our life when we have to. And I like this, uh, when Zacchaeus jumped down out of the tree and Jesus said, I'm coming to your house, the Bible says that, that Zacchaeus welcomed him gladly. We need a little glad in the church. We need a little glad handing. We need some gladness. David said, I, I was glad when they said, let's go to the house of the Lord. I didn't get mad. I didn't try to make an excuse. I didn't say I had a busy weekend. They say, I needed to sleep. I've worked too hard. Um, I've heard that sermon before. The, the, it's too cold in there. Jeremy sings too loud. They didn't sing none of that. He just got up. And he, they came, and, and, and David said, I was glad. I was glad. I was excited. Zachary said, I'm glad you're coming to my house. I want you to come. It's not like, oh, how many of us would be glad if Jesus said, I'm coming to your house today? i tell you what we'd do, we'd, we'd, we'd stop by food line. You ladies would stop by food line, or you'd send a husband with a list, and you would run home and start cleaning. You would try to head off the master. you get there cleaning, and there'd only be like two rooms open to him. That's what we do when we can't get to it. We shut doors. As long as your door's clean, they don't know. But we'd have some preparation to do. You know, a lot of us would not be comfortable that Jesus said we wouldn't be glad if he was coming to our house. I'd be so excited. Can I honestly tell you I would not care? Sister Kelly would freak out. I would not care. He could come to my house. And we had grandbabies this weekend, so you can just imagine. I was glad. The Bible says, I think it's Psalms 100. The Bible says that we are to serve the Lord with gladness. There is nothing more depressing than a, a church serving the Lord with sadness. There's nothing more depressing. We got to serve. Take a tax collector for an example. We've got to serve the Lord with gladness. Uh, David says, Psalms 45, and, and this is an analogy, this is a parallel to what it's going to be like in heaven, the bride of Christ. But he said that the bride will be led into the palace of the king with joy and gladness. Are you going to be happy when you get to heaven? Why aren't you happy now that you're going to heaven? I mean, every day can be a day of joy and gladness and, and excitement and praising God. 
I mean, every day of our life. Every day should be a day. Because, church, this is the day. Now, it may not be a great day for you. It may be a bad day. You, you may be obsessed and contemplating and preoccupied with Monday or next week. Who's got something hanging over your head next week? Just tell me, who's got something hanging over your head? There's a bunch of us. Church, this is the day that the Lord has made. I don't care what is going on in your life next week or today. This is the day that the Lord hath made, and I will rejoice, and I will be glad, regardless of what's coming against me, regardless of my issues. I will rejoice, and I'll be glad in it. Zacchaeus was glad in it. The children were glad in it. The blind man was glad in it. And this gives me these three simple points. Write these down, first of all. How do we go from short change to eternally change? Here you go, first of all. Verse 3 says this, He wanted to see Jesus but could not because of the crowd. The first thing is this, people will always test our determination when we're trying to get to Jesus. Write this down, I want you to understand. People will always test your determination when you're trying to get to Jesus. You have to understand the role that people play. Some of you know it, some of you think you know it. I want to try to make it clear to you today. Because attitude has so much to do with you breaking through. He wanted to see Jesus, but because of the crowd, he could not. He wanted to get to Jesus. He wanted to be touched. He wanted to have his life changed. But because of people, he could not. I took our grandbabies, my mom and my sister, to a, we did a family picnic Friday. And we went to this little park in Ringo. We ran by, we got chicken. I took mom so she could buy the chicken. <laughs> and me and mom and Pammy and the babies went to the park. We even took little court, a little baby. We get there, two things were against us. Number one, it was like 30 below zero. And the wind was blowing. I thought we were in Antarctica. And we get there and get out of the car, and there's like 70 grown-ups there because some work business in Ringgold is having an office party at a kid's playground. So already, I was in a bad mood. So we get out with our chicken. We're chasing napkins. We're running all over. The, all these people are getting all the good seats in the sun. But we ate our mashed potatoes. Bless God, we ate our coleslaw. Come on, victory. And I had the biggest chicken breast I've ever seen in my life. I mean, that, that, that looked like a, uh, somebody had killed a duck or something. It was, so we're eating, we're chasing babies. When things settle down, we try to get everybody in the sun. Well, this, now remember I'm talking about people are always going to test your determination. So this big group of uh, workers, they're, they're going to do a carry an egg on a spoon relay. I'm talking about men and women, all ages, all sizes. So I said, grandbabies, gather around. We're going to watch this. <laughs> and so we got a position. And so they had these eggs on these spoons, and it was like a relay around this track where we were. One lady, she was just a little bit overweight, a little bit clumsy. She, she was, I mean, she was wearing it out, getting her egg, and she just trips and does a face plant. One of the babies got a face plant, pot of face plant. So we're, we're like over there doing the wave. We're doing the wave. One lady almost got her egg to the other end of the line, and, and, I mean, she was really doing good, and then she took her eyes and looked at a person, and it fell off, and then she had to go all the way back, and she said, you distracted me. And there were people, once they got their egg to the other person, when the other team was trying to get their egg to their person, they ran beside them the whole way yelling in their ear. I've never seen such poor sportsmanship in my life. There were some over here behind the bush they were pushing and fighting. They were dropping eggs. They dropped their eggs because they, they lost focus. They got distracted. They took their eyes off the prize. Uh, people hindered them. You know, sometime in life we drop our eggs. Have you ever dropped your egg? Everything's going so good, Pastor Joey. I'm, I'm winning this thing. I got my egg on the spoon. 
I'm going to make it. And then something happens and we drop it. We've got to go all the way back. It is no fun going back and picking up an egg and running with an egg. It was cold. It was Wednesday, windy. I was, th I was thinking, God, we were watching it. The babies were eating it up. They were having a, a good time to see adults act like that. And I'm like they're trying to do a sermon illustration. Now, this is how we don't act. We be good sports. We don't yell at people. We don't trip people. And like one guy had his egg, and, and the other guy was behind him, and he kept weaving in front of him. And I'm like, foul, you're out of there, foul. Getting in another person's way. But the good thing I thought of is this, you know, we, we may not make it to the end with our egg intact. How many of you could say, Pastor Joy, I have a whole life serving God. I've never dropped my egg one time. You know, my favorite egg is a scrambled egg. Scrambled eggs taste good. You know, scrambled eggs are nutritious. Scrambled eggs work. Listen, you may not have a hard-boiled egg that's not cracked, but you can make it to heaven being a scrambled egg. I'm a scrambled egg. And what I want you to understand is, okay, if you drop your egg, make something out of it, scramble it, and let God use you anyway. But I, I want you to understand there are going to be people that are going to affect your determination because they don't want you to succeed. They don't want you to get through. They don't want you to make it through. They don't want you to win the race. They're gonna, the Bible says when Jesus said, Zacchaeus, man, I know you've been a sinner, but I'm coming to your house. You know what the Bible says? People muttered. They complained. The Pharisee, the religious guy, muttered and complained. The blind man that just wanted to have his eyes changed and healed. People complained that, that he was talking too loud. Little babies that just wanted to sit in Jesus' lap. People were hindering them. There's a passage I want to read. It's, David understood this, Psalms 41, just, just a few verses here. All my enemies whisper together against me. They imagine the worst of me all the time. A vile disease has beset him, and he'll get up from the place where he lies. Even my close friends whom I trusted, People used to eat with me. They've lifted up their hand against me. But you, O oh Lord, have mercy on me. Raise me up that I may repay them. I know that you are pleased with me, for my enemy does not triumph over me. And my key word here, write this down somewhere, integrity, integrity, integrity. In my integrity, you uphold me, and you set me in your presence forever. Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, for everlasting and everlasting. Amen and amen. Keep your integrity. That's the hardest thing to do when your friends are attacking you, when people are attacking you. I remember one time that, that, I, that I had what I thought was a friend attacking me and messing with my life. I couldn't understand it. I felt exactly like David. The Lord gave me a scripture. It wasn't that one, but it was another one in, in, in Psalms where David talked about friends and people betraying you and and just to hold on and keep integrity, and I did. I didn't, I didn't complain to people. I didn't make a big deal. I just waited. See, sometimes we want to handle things when we get hurt. We want to handle it. Or we want to tell God how to kill them. And sometimes it's not that extreme. You know, put them in the emergency room, something like that. <laughs> but when we learn to pray, God, I want you to handle this, but I want you to handle it the way that you seem best, that seems best to you. That's how I want you to handle it. Can I tell you, in my situation, the Lord gave me, and this had gone on for about two weeks, and I thought everything, I was mad, I was hurt. I wanted to, I had a lot of things that I could say. Um, have you ever argued in your head, like, for hours? I like those because I usually win those. Once it, once it gets out of my head, who knows, but... But I just try to have integrity. And after about two weeks, God gave me that scripture. And uh, I even shared it with Pam later, but God gave me that scripture. Three hours later, after God gave me that scripture, that whole thing changed. God dealt in his way. Um, um, I was reconciled. I was validated. It, I'm just telling you, God's faithful. But we have to understand that people and people if not necessarily just set up against you sometimes we let people's attitudes and people's opinions affect us the children were rebuked the blind man was told to be quiet 
The world doesn't understand uh, our need and our desperation to get to Jesus. I mean, we're desperate to get to Jesus. We, we should want to be desperate. One, one climbed out, one cried out, one went out. But they all in their way found Jesus, and they didn't let people hold them back. How do we get past people? We've got we to gotta have a humble heart. We've got to have integrity. We've got a humble heart, a bold spirit. We must cry out, and we must sell out. And that's the cool thing with Zacchaeus. He was willing to sell out. We must be determined we're going to make it. And remember, if you drop your egg, it's okay to make it in being a scrambled egg. Okay? It's okay you can make it in that way, and we can be eternally changed. So people will always test our determination when we try to get to Jesus. Second thing, and I just got one more after this, there are divine appointments we can't afford to miss. Write that down. There are divine appointments we can't afford to miss. The Bible says when Jesus reached, verse 5, the spot, he looked up and he spoke to Zacchaeus. You know, keeping appointments is frustrating. Who likes to keep appointments? And when you do keep your appointment with a doctor, he doesn't keep his. You have to wait an hour. We just don't like appointments. We have, like, time issues. We, there's a spirit of lateness in the world. Come on. Can I get an amen? There's a spirit of lateness. In the world today, untimeliness. We just have issues with appointments. We, we fight with time. But listen, you can't afford to miss a divine appointment. You can't really afford to miss a doctor's appointment. You know they charge you anyway. You can't afford to miss it. Of course, we're experts at obtaining things we can't afford. You could have got by with that 19-inch TV, but oh, no, you got the wall-to-wall TV with a weed of seed. Knocked out. You can even drive it to work. And some of us are still paying for a wall-to-wall TV. See, we will invest in things we can't afford. Can I tell you this? Because of Christ, we can afford salvation. That's something you can invest in. You can get it. It comes free because of what he did. There's things we can back, but appointments are important. Uh, when my appointment comes up, I've got these hill spurs things going on, and I start getting texts a week before I'm supposed to be there for that appointment. I've already got three shots in my heel to help this hill spur thing. I'm doing so much better. Uh, last week, I, I only cried for like 90 seconds, and that is a big change. Got a Scooby do Band Aid coloring book and a ring pop. And so I'm doing well. But the thing is this, it hurts, it's not fun, but when I keep that appointment, can I tell you, keeping spiritual appointments helps you get well. They'll heal you. Like for me, coming to church, we come to church on Sundays, this is like a divine appointment. Anytime you come, it'll heal you. It'll help you get well. You may have to get a shot. It doesn't feel good, but it'll help you get well. It'll help you get strong. You need to have an appointment to get in the Word and get on your knees and pray. You may not like it may not be comfortable when the Holy Spirit deals with you, but can I tell you, the healing process will begin. When Zacchaeus jumped down out of that tree, the healing process began. When the blind man crawled to Jesus and he touched him, the healing process began. So God wants to heal us, but you can't miss your divine appointments. You've got to be there. You've got to keep your, your eye on the prize. You've got to keep your head up. And the cool thing is this. I mean, it's so, Jesus is so precise. I mean, he, he hit the, the spot where Zacchaeus was. I mean, all this, he's traveling, trying to get to Jerusalem. He's outside of Jericho by the Sea of Galilee. He's outside of Jericho. He's in Jericho. He's, he's headed to Galilee. He comes upon Zacchaeus, and at the right spot, my dad used to have a say, and he'd drink something that tasted good, and he'd say, this hits the spot. It hits the spot. I got a little girl, Cashlin, my next to the youngest grandbaby, if, if anybody's in my lap or by me when, we're, when they come and pile into bed with us, if anybody's near me, she comes up and she stands there and she, she goes, that's my spot. And if they don't move, it doesn't matter. She gets on top of them. She gets her, she, she's in, she, that's her spot. That is her spot. Last night, I, I've, got, I've got this district council. I was packing. I was in, in our big walk-in closet and I'm packing. And I'm out of the living room. Grandbabies are running around. I hear this little pitter-patter. It's kind of like a, a little muskrat going through the house. And, and I'm in the closet, and here comes little Cortland. She stands about that high. And she comes, she stands, and she jabbers at me a little bit. 
and she holds out her hand. She takes my finger. She leads me in the living room, and she takes me to the place where I sit on the couch, and she pats it. I sat down. I said, well, you want Potter to hold you? She just walks off. She don't want me to hold her. So I'm like, uh, what just happened? I didn't understand what just happened. So I sat there a little bit. I got up, went back to the closet, and I'm doing my stuff. I mean, three minutes later, she takes my finger, takes me back in the living room, pats the, and Pam said, she just wants you in your spot. That's your spot. She wants to see Pada in his spot. You know, spots are a big deal. We do, when you have a wedding, everybody's got their spot, right? You do a play, everybody's got a spot. Jesus is always in the right spot. When he finally made it to Jerusalem, he's out on a mountain spot, and he's looking over the city, and he's weeping, and he's interceding for the city. When, he, when he's traveling up to Jericho, he comes by a place, and there's a, there's, a, there's a lot of little kids standing around, and it was the exact place he needed to be to, to, to give a story, an analogy, a truth about what heaven's like. And he was in the right spot because there were adults there that needed to understand about heaven. He, he went to a, outside of Jericho. There was a blind man that just happened to be there, and the people told him, well, nothing's by accident. Jesus ended up at that right spot at the right time to heal that blind man, and then he goes into Jericho, and he's under the right tree at the right time with the right man in the right spot, and he saves Zacchaeus' soul. And then a few weeks later, he goes up on a hill. He's in the right place on the right cross, and today he's in the right place by the right hand of the Father and he's ever interceding for us and today you're in the right spot for him and he wants to meet your need today we're in the right spot Jesus is always right on time he's always in the right place for us he's where we need him to be he's here for us he's here to change our life listen there is no promise of tomorrow he's passing by today if you want eternal change if you want God to do something in your life today, if you're here and some of you are here and you feel like by circumstances you've been shortchanged. We talk to people all the time, the way they were raised, the things that they've gone through. They make bad decisions. I mean, we, we talk to and minister to people that have been molested and abused by authority figures and parents we we talk to wives that have been abused and just horribly treated we talk to men that have uh, been in all kinds of bondage and different things in their life and and they just feel like they were born i've heard it said they would just feel like we were born under a, a black star or a wrong star we just just our life is it just feels like we've been cursed and there are people today that feel like they've been shortchanged some of you feel like you've been shortchanged in your marriage. You've been shortchanged in your job, shortchanged in your personal life, shortchanged in your health because you struggle in, in areas and ways that other people aren't struggling. What well, can I tell you today? Jesus paid the debt. We're not shortchanged. We're blessed. And if you'll let him meet you today and do that work. And then finally, this. Scripture says in verse 8, Here and now I give half my possessions to the poor. We'll close out with this. Jeremy, if you would like to come. And get in place, get in your spot. Write this down. Remember what we possess isn't nearly as important as what we release. Remember what you possess isn't nearly as important as what you release. Verse 8 says, here and now I give half my possessions to the poor. I mean, one of my favorite historical characters was a guy named Pepe Le Pew. I love Pepe Le Pew because Pepe Le Pew was in love with a cat. So in order to marry that cat, he had to paint the white stripe, and, and he had a lot to offer. Pepe Le Pew, he was a smooth talker, and he made himself look like a cat. He would just pudink, 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 prance around. But every now and then, the skunk in Pepe would come out. He couldn't help what was inside of him. It wasn't necessarily what he possessed, all the talent and ability that made him the skunk. It was what he released. And that 
saved him a lot of times. That was his protection. That was his identity. That was his strength. That, that was his weapon. Now, thank God we're not built like skunks. Thank God. But if we read this passage, I mean, there are things that you and I can release. And today, like at the end of the service, I hope we're able to release something to bless Kenya. I mean, we're blessed, even though we may not have everything we want and all we want, but Zacchaeus was a wealthy guy. The Bible says that he was rich. But you know, the Bible never says how much money he had. It never says what kind of house he lived in or what kind of a camel he drove. But the Bible does tell you how much he gave back. The Bible tells you how much he gave to the poor. He gave half to the poor and he gave four times to those he was wrong. What the Bible gives you details on is not what he possessed but what he released because he was willing to turn loose. And my challenge today, church, is this. What are, what are you and I releasing? Are we releasing anything? Are we really giving anything? Are we giving what we should? There's so much. As a matter of fact, our bulletin. Did you do the bulletin, Tony? Did you do that little thing? Uh, have you got a bulletin, Brenda? You read loud. I want you to stand up, turn that around. Richard told me you were loud. Stand up and uh, listen. I want you to uh, and I want you to read out loud because listen, I didn't tell Tony to put this in, but I want you to read this. It's on the last page, Brenda. And that little blurb Tony put in. Listen to this. Listen. Yes. <clears throat> now, as you as you as you read this today, and as you you hear what, what I'm trying, just the best way I can to to get this message in your spirit. And I know I'm bumbling around, but listen. When I read um, about the rich man, he had a lot of things. But the thing that would have saved his soul had nothing to do with what he had. It was what he was willing to release. Jesus said, I know you got a lot, but are you willing to give it all up? And he couldn't. He couldn't release it. He couldn't turn it loose. Now listen, this isn't all about material things and finances. Um, some of you need to release your hurt and your bitterness. Some of you need to turn that loose. Some of you need to release your unforgiveness. Some of you need to release your fear. What are you willing to release to have a divine encounter with God? What are you willing to give? Are you going to hold on to that gift and that ability and that burden and that vision that God's given you when he's crying out today? My church needs you. The community needs you. Heaven needs you. The lost need you. Will you release this for me? Pharisees, there, there's, there's a passage, I scribbled some of it down, it's, it's John 5, 38 through 40, and I've kind of paraphrased, but the religious were real haughty, we have a lot of people that want to argue the word of God, just read it and love it and live it, read it, love it and live it, God didn't send it down to argue and debate and for man to have his way with, but Jesus struggled with this in his day, and the Pharisees would take this word and they would quote the scripture and they would quote the word and they would know the word but they refused to know the Savior and that Pharisee that was rebuking 
the tax collector was one of these. And Jesus in John, in chapter 5, he's basically telling them that they know the word, but then knowing the word is not enough, and having the word in your heart is not enough if you don't release faith in Jesus. So most of us know somebody that can quote Scripture better than we can, but unless they give their, their life to the Lord, they're going to hell. Quote the Scripture won't save you. But releasing your faith, releasing your hurt, releasing your unbelief so that you can walk in him and with him. So church, if you would stand with me this morning. Is anybody willing to go on all in with me for Jesus? Are you willing to jump out of the tree with your pastor? I'd like for some of you just come to this altar and, and that that's you're in the trees out there. And if some of you would come to this altar and say, Pastor, I'm gonna jump out of the tree with you. And uh I may get into heaven looking like a scrambled egg, but brother, me and you's getting in. Just Pastor, I'm gonna jump out of the tree with you, and I'm gonna love more than I've ever loved. I'm gonna release this this stuff I've been carrying around, these things I've been holding on to. I'm willing to release, and I'm, re I'm willing to, to let God change my life. But today I want to do more. Now I want you all to look and think about who Jesus changed here and the lessons we can learn. First of all, he wants you to come like a little child, not stay back there overanalyzing and being analytical. The wisdom of man is the foolishness of God. He wants childlikeness in you and I. He wants you to be childlike. He doesn't want you to be like the Pharisee. He is fed up to hear with religious people. Religious, religion's a dime a dozen. There's nothing to religion. Religion doesn't save you. Your name on a membership card doesn't save you. Your denomination doesn't save you. And grandma doesn't save you. What saves you is you knowing Jesus. That Pharisee busted hell wide open if he did not change. But there was a tax collector that had lived for the devil his whole life that got a glimpse of Jesus and said, I'm coming down out of the tree, and I'm willing to change. I know I, I, I'm doing wrong, and like a, like a little child, I'm going to come up here, and God, just forgive me. There was a blind man whose eyes he opened, and some of us, we, we go through life blind. We don't see spiritual things. We can't get past ourselves. We can't get past our hurt. I mean, I deal with people all the time, church, that, that choose the world over God. They choose the world. They want to live like the world. They want to live in carnality. They, they, they refuse to, to release, and they're blind. We, we, we live in a world today that spiritually is they're so hopeless. Why are they hopeless? Because they, they're spiritually blind, and they're starving to death. But Jesus opens the eyes of not just the physically blind like this beggar, but he opened his spiritual eyes. This guy had never seen Jesus, just heard he was coming. Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth, Son of God, heal me. Open my eyes. Let me see. And then Zacchaeus, short little squatty fella. But thank God he could climb like a monkey. He used his gifts to get in place to see Jesus. Use what you have to get in position to see Jesus. The most awesome thing here, Jesus could have, he was in Jericho. A lot of rich people lived in Jericho. A lot of people, religious people lived in Jericho. A lot of people had better name recognition, positive name recognition. But whose house did he go to and pronounce in front of everybody? Go into your house. Do you want him in your house? I like for it to be clean, but you know, if it's Jesus, I don't care. Because my life was a lot dirtier in my living room. My life was a lot messier than that garage. And can I tell you, that is going some to say that. Of course, I blame it on the grandbabies. It's good to have grandbabies. You could, you could get, they take a lot of heat. Anything that gets broke, anything that gets lost. Well, sweetheart, I don't know. I, I didn't have your checkbook. Cortland had it. She was, I don't know, trying to buy a toy online out of something. But I'm glad you're up here. I really am. 
And listen, if you will with me help us to be excellent in ministry, excellence in ministry. The tax collector, the blind man, I believe that from that time on, they strived to be excellent in everything they did for God and would do that. And we'll build his kingdom. We'll be blessed. And, and, and the Bible says here when you're just willing to give what God requires of you, you don't only get blessed big here, you get blessed big there. You get Because you're a child of God. Your father owns a cattle of a thousand hills. He's the co- owner, the keeper, the creator of the universe. And he says, there's nothing that's too hard for me, nothing I can't supply you with. I, I can meet your needs according to my riches, my riches in glory. I want you to pray. As we pray this morning, you just pray that prayer with me. Lord, I'm coming down out of the tree. I can be like so many religious, so many churches, so many denominations. I can sit up there and just watch the parade. And I can watch the guest speakers. I can watch the praise team. I can watch the preacher. I can watch the media, watch the bands roll by. But, God, I don't want to be up here aloof and detached watching what you're doing. I want to be right in the middle of what you're doing. And I'm jumping down off my high horse today. And, God, I'm going to make myself available. Let's pray that prayer. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, I want to make myself available, God, more so than ever. Lord, I want to hear your voice. I want to be sensitive Holy Spirit, do not leave me. Holy Spirit, quicken me. Holy Spirit, challenge me. Holy Spirit, convict me. Holy Spirit, guide me. Holy Spirit, enlighten me. We are Spirit-filled people. We're Spirit-led, Father. We are full gospel. We believe this word is true. We believe you healed then, you healed now. We believe you raised up people then, you raised them up now. We believe you saved and changed lives then. You save and change lives now. You deliver us. You protect us. You help us overcome our fear. You break those cycles in our life because you're God. You you have all authority over heaven and earth. What we bind here, you bind here. What we bind in heaven, you bind in heaven. Father, there's an agreement with us, God, that you work in us and through us. And Father, I, I pray for this congregation of believers. I pray, God, when we come back next Sunday, God, there'll be just an excitement and an expectation in us. Holy Spirit, challenge us, Father, that we pray more this week than we've ever prayed, that we pray, that we're called to prayer, we're encouraged to pray, we desire to pray. Help us be a people, Heavenly Father, that are called to pray. And Heavenly Father, when it gets close to next Sunday and when we get in our cars and on our bicycles or in our tennis shoes, however we get here, Father, let us say that I was glad to go to the house of the Lord. I was glad to go and be in your presence. And it's in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you. Give God a hand clap of praise in the house.